So good afternoon. And um, like Baye, I, uh, I want to express just the gratitude and, and deep honor that I feel uh, being here representing uh, not only myself, um, but my community back home. And um, perhaps um, like Baye, um, those of us who come from communities um, like Newark and the South Bronx in this country, I can feel a particular responsibility um, and a particular sense of honor and gratitude um, to, for me, for the opportunity to be in institutions like Harvard. Um, I would be remiss if I did not um, remember the shoulders upon which I stand, my own family, uh, and uh, as a Puerto Rican in Harvard, um, uh, another uh, wonderful, Puerto Rican, famous Puerto Rican from Harvard uh, upon whose shoulders I stand. Our own uh, Puerto Rican liberator, Don Pedro Luis Campos, who uh, honored the halls of Harvard, and um, and I want to believe that I stand on his shoulders, and that the community from which I come ultimately stands on mine. And um, so, to them, I dedicate this moment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, building community power and the concept of Earth and people as sacred. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of a context from. Um, this is uh, the community from which I come. It's uh, located in the South Bronx, just... Okay, I don't want to mess this up. Oh, I did. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I was born right here in public housing projects in the South Bronx. Uh, probably one of the, the most uh, Notable things about my community is that in less than square mile, in less than one square mile, we are crisscrossed by four major highways, um, bringing hundreds of thousands of uh, vehicle and uh, primarily truck traffic, um, not just along the Cross Bronx Expressway, the Bronx River Parkway, the Bruckner Expressway, and the Sheridan Expressway, um, but through uh, neighborhood streets. Um, as a result of that, we uh, experience all sorts of issues, not the least of which is lots of upper respiratory ailments, like asthma. We have some of the highest asthma rates in the United States. Um, so if I had to buy, I sort of started with the, the list of sort of how he got to where he went and uh, how, how he arrived here. Um, and uh, it was many really interesting institutions of uh, government and higher learning. Uh, so I want to share a little bit about how I got here. Probably a little bit of a different path than I um, I began here in the public housing projects of, of the South Bronx, the Bronx River public housing projects. Um, that was my bedroom window. <laughs> as a little girl, and it's an important perch for me because um, as a child of the 60s and 70s, uh, it was the safest place for me this one. So I spent a lot of time on the washing machine looking out the window. Um, and, uh, and listening to the music of this man, this is, if you know, if you know a little bit about the cult, the history of hip hop, is uh, DJ Africa Bambada. Uh, Bronx River Projects is known as the birthplace of hip hop. And um, so this is part of the legacy uh, that was left <coughs> in my community. Um, but I came to be, I came of age at a time um, that many of you, actually, some of you, you all would probably be able to tell me a lot more than I know about this. Um, I experienced it, I haven't, uh, and I'm, I'm actually here to learn more about sort of the, the phenomenon of the burning of the South Bronx um, and this legacy of a public policy known as planned shrinkage and uh, benign neglect. Um, what I understand of it is, um, uh, is, is from the memory of a child who could not complete a sentence uh, without it being interrupted by the sound of uh, fire engines and sirens. Um, remembers constantly the acrid taste of smoke in the air, and remembers waking up on a regular basis um, to my community uh, and uh, <coughs> storefronts in the community, uh, literally up in smoke, uh, with families who had lived there. Um, so where planned shrinkage, I mean, lots of people can know about um, and, can, and have made arguments about what went wrong. Uh, what went wrong in our community um, was that not everyone had the opportunity to leave, not everyone had the option to move on. And so, while that was uh, a way, um, my community began to think about, uh, might there be another way? Um, and as I sort of traveled and journeyed uh, on the journey away from the South Bronx, which is, you know, truthfully what kids like myself and, and kids in these neighborhoods are taught, right? We're taught that the measure of our success will not be to stay and to help rebuild our communities, but in fact, to um, 
to figure out how far we can get from them. And so that was part of my early professional journey. Uh, but there came a point in my life where uh, I began to remember, I'd like to say I began to remember who I really was and who I really belonged to. Um, and so questions um, and lessons that I had been taught as a child, like this African proverb, the idea that we belong to one another, that I am because we are, and because we are, I am. Um, and ideas like when people lead, leaders will follow, um, began to sort of really percolate in me in my early 20s as I sort of began a journey back home. Um, and I began this journey sort of connected to the one um, organization and institution that never left the community. And, um, and that really was, uh, in communities like ours, sort of the mainstay and, and the place of organizing and power, and that was um, my local church, um, Holy Cross Church. I was born and raised uh, and formed in Franciscan spirituality, if you're at all familiar with that. Was my, that was my old pastor, Father Mike Tyson. Was his name. <laughs> and uh, it was an appropriate one. And um, I'll tell you more about that. But so I'll just I, so that that was sort of my second place, my second place of education. So first was my community, and I learned urban planning, sort of this backwards way, um, through through my experiences as a child. But then I also began to kind of understand community in a different way. I began to understand this concept of belonging uh, and this concept of power um, that I had um, really sort of misunderstood in my search for power. Uh, individual success in the first season of my life. And so I came back home and began doing some uh, organizing work uh, with the church against uh, the next sort of um, um, difficult issue that hit our community, which was the, the crack epidemic. Um, the crack epidemic led us to do some community organizing as church folk, which uh, then led to the torching of our church uh, in retaliation by drug dealers in 1992, in November of 1992. And I say that that, um, that moment really fundamentally changed my life. And uh, what I, I think the, the biggest question that I asked, and at the time I was working, I, I worked in, in lots of places. I did some work in banking. I did some work, um, some work in community development, but from a banking, uh, from Chase Manhattan Bank. I worked uh, under the leadership of the then chairman, uh, David Rockefeller. And so I understood, and you could see, sort of, I, I sort of had a, a particular concept of power that had been later taught to me. But I also had a concept of power that had been taught to me by my family, by my father, who has a third grade education, who was a maintenance man in the public housing projects that I grew up in. And one of them, I, I think one of the most profound experiences for me um, was at that march, um, looking around at the 1,200 people in my community who showed up um, in protest uh, at the desecration uh, of, our, of our house of worship. Um, not to see people like David Rockefeller, all, all respect to him, but to see people like my father um, and people from the community and uh, the documented, the undocumented, the young, the old. And uh, I began to sort of uh, question what power really was and what type of power I wanted to build for myself and for my community. Um, so out of that experience, um, I left my work and, and really began sort of the third leg of this journey of in, in understanding what community is and how to build community. And I began by uh, founding my first organization, which is an organization called Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice. And there, um, I really wanted to create a place for the um, 15,000 young people like myself that had been born and raised in this community. And let this were 15,000 young people in less than a square mile, 50% of whom lived below the poverty level, um, and for whom there had never been a youth serving organization beyond week, not, you know, once a week church youth group services. And so I wanted to create a place like that, but a place where we could really begin to understand our power and begin to sort of remake and, and rethink this legacy of planned shrinkage um, and this vision of urban planning. Might we be able to do it for ourselves? Uh, I'll pass over some of this, but it was very important for us to think about issues uh, around planning, perhaps a little, and use some language perhaps a little differently than, than than what you all may use here. Um, we use language and planning such as justice, dignity, um, nonviolence and truth force, building indigenous leadership, staying and rebuilding communities, uh, affirming uh, uh, our faith in a just, prophetic, and inclusive way, um, building a culture of self-reflection and or, uh, openness to change. Um, and so our conceptual framework um, was, uh, was pretty simple. 
Um, we had all experienced the social service institutions coming into our community that were trying to transform us, you know, trying to fix us. Um, we call those the, the missionary um, models that would come in and, and, um, and sort of drop sort of parachute services into our community to try to save us. Not terrible things, but um, in and of themselves, not enough. Um, we had also experienced um, the legacy of community organizing in the South Bronx um, in the 60s and 70s. And um, so we understood what it was and the importance of, of transforming systems as well, not just working on people, but also working on systems, education, housing, policing, et cetera, that caused the conditions um, uh, for people to live in poverty. Um, and then, but we also understood, and I began to understand that all of those without then also the transformation of infrastructure, places people lived, places people played, places people worshipped and worked, um, were not enough. And um, so I call the intersection of that sort of the intersection of faith and social change, justice, um, perhaps a, another way to say it is that I believe deeply in, um, in relationships that are not just transactional, um, but are transformational. And I, I believe that all three of these are necessary for transformational relationships and communities to be built. And so we began um, simply um, not necessarily in a way that um, perhaps others would when they come into communities like ours and, and want to plan for renewal. Uh, we began by affirming youth leadership, not building, not saying we're empowering youth, not saying we're new, uh, we're building young people, but that we're affirming already existing capacity and already existing leadership, which by in and of itself was a really important way to begin to look at community because when I was growing up, um, the model was a deficit-based model. So I was looked at as the at risk. I was looked at at all of the potential bad things that could happen to me, not as, as, as anyone that had the potential to create and make change in our community. So just the way we were looked at and described in community became important. Um, we moved into a place of figuring out how to trust our own wisdom and our own experience. Uh, one of our favorite signs that we would carry to um, meetings uh, was, we live here, we're experts too. Um, and that's a really difficult um, place to be, particularly in, in circles where we, are, um, where we are constantly sort of pushed out, in many ways just by language um, and acronyms. <laughs> and uh, we, we also worked around demystifying the systems and language of planning, using our own, um, using our own ways, our own traditions. Um, we continue to move by fearlessly speaking truth to power um, in our communities. Um, I love this picture because this, okay, this man right there, that's my dad. And uh, you'll see him in lots of pictures. Uh, my dad with a third grade education who, um, whose job it was to wash urine off of elevator walls in the public housing projects, uh, never missed an opportunity um, to stand and speak truth to power. And, um, it's a real example of courage to me, along with these beautiful young people, elementary school students, uh, who had the courage to stand up to uh, big polluters like uh, our local energy company in our community. Um, but we believed in doing this in, in our voice and in our way. There's Daddy again. <laughs> There's Mommy. That's my mom. um, uh, using theater, guerrilla theater tactics we used often. Um, song, play, dance, art, creating, um, really believing that we could, people speak different languages, that they learn in different ways and that we can communicate issues of community and issues of justice um, in a variety of ways and that we need to honor those ways. Um, and for us also prayer and reflection was a really important part of the history of the community. It's a, commu uh, a deeply spiritual uh, community, primarily Latino and African American community. So here are some examples. There's Daddy again. <laughs> um, this is a, a way of the cross that we do every year. Um, where instead of crucifying um, uh, Jesus, we crucify um, bad planning in our neighborhood. Here we are crucifying. <laughs> we do. This is here we were crucifying a, a highway, an underutilized highway, um, and uh, so we literally would read and pray and we nail it to the cross. Um, so to give community a different vision of what death and resurrection might look like, um, we believe in seeing what others do not see. I believe deeply in the in the power of vision and uh, in the visions that we carry. This is, um, this is what people saw in our community. This is an abandoned cement plant um, that I grew up playing in. This is ribbon cutting. So many things to share. This is it today. It's part of the Bronx, South Bronx Greenway. Beautiful park 
with uh, bike trails, pedestrian trails, a small amphitheater. And that was uh, actually supposed to, slated to be a, a truck route through our neighborhood. And we, um, through our organizing and advocacy work, won back a $13 million allocation that had been given to this uh, state to build a truck route and had it reallocated for the building of this greenway. Building green roofs. Building solidarity, I think, was another way and another important thing I want to continue to explore. Uh, and challenging traditional views of partnership. Um, not partnership that comes in and takes over a community, not partnership that comes in and uh, eats up, you know, big fish, small fish, uh, but partnership that really honors the voice of community. Large institutions like in New York, the Pratt Center and the Trusty Transportation Campaign, and small community organizations like these. Um, debunking this missionary mentality that um, y'all as planners are going to come in and fix and save us. Um, but really understanding uh, solidarity and um, building community resiliency through building, uh, also building not just buildings but organizational infrastructure. So, hence um, these are or other organizations that I worked to found because they were necessary. Um, Public-private partnerships like the Bronx River Alliance and uh, an activist advocacy group like the Southern Bronx River Watershed Alliance. Um, and I think for me, though, the most important thing that we built, and I'll, I'll end on this, is, um, is trusting what we don't see and understanding the legacy of dignity, of voice, and of self-determination. And so for some of you, um, or, or for some folks, the, the, the idea of coming into a community like mine to do planning um, uh, would be perhaps to kind of you know, design a beautiful park, design a beautiful bridge, a beautiful structure, and, and your, the, the gift you leave to me uh, perhaps would be this structure. Um, I deeply believe that that, whatever that is, 100 years from now, may not be there. Um, but what will be there um, is the legacy passed down through people, like my own children, uh, that was not passed down to me. I was passed down a legacy of powerlessness, um, of learned helplessness, of things happen to us and that I have no voice. Um, and the legacy that uh, good community planning processes, I believe, um, really pass on is a legacy of power and dignity to people that, that will surpass um, any institution, any building, any street that we plan and work on. Um, like this young man, I, I, Youth Ministries was founded 20 years ago and David started with me when he was 13 and he's now the executive director of the organization that I've left behind in order to be here. Um, to figure out what it is that I'm doing next. What's my next song, I'd like to say. Um, so these are some of the questions I'm going to explore here. Um, does planning have a soul? Does Harvard have a soul? <laughs> <laughs> the jury's still out on that one. <laughs> um, you know, is there such thing as, as sacred space and, uh, and, sacred, is, and sacred community? Um, can we look beyond um, the buildings that we're building or the streets that we're designing, and really understand the relationship of the people that will dwell in those places. I want to explore and write about community planning methods that honor various forms of expertise and multiple ways of learning and communicating. I want to um, I want to look at community planning and its intersections with community organizing. Um, uh, not natural bedfellows, but I think um, really interesting intersections there. And I want to uh, explore this issue of how to build individual and community resiliency and leadership during my year. I'll leave you with this. Um, this is the quote that sat on my desk for all the 20 years. Somebody gave it to me the first one uh, early on my planning. And they said, you know, if you want to be a good leader and uh, you want to be a good community builder, remember that you need to go to the people, live with them, learn from them, love them, start with what you know, build with what they have. And of the best of leaders, when the work is done, the task accomplished, the people will say, we have done it ourselves. <laughs>